when Minnesota voters go to the polls in November, they will vote on two ballot initiatives. We've already spoken about the marriage amendment. Now, Representative Mary Kiffmeyer is here to discuss voter photo ID. Thank you so much for joining us here at Capitol Report. Glad to be with you. So, Representative Kiffmeyer, let's begin with the definition of the photo voter ID amendment. The state Supreme Court recently ruled in favor of the language that was recommended by the legislature to be placed on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of encapsulate for us just exactly what voters will be saying either yes or no to? Well, they'll be saying yes or no. And by the way, if you leave it blank, that's the same as a no. That's the rules on voting on constitutional amendments. And so they'll be voting on the very simple process of saying, is a photo ID required as a part of the voting process? And also they will see that a free ID will be provided and that it takes effect July 1st, 2013 for that November election. But the essence of this constitutional amendment is the photo ID requirement. You just mentioned the free ID provided, so I'd like to jump ahead to one of my questions. So if this does pass, how much responsibility do you believe the state does have in ensuring that those who might have a difficult time obtaining this ID, like a college kid or an elder, somebody who's elderly, how much of the onus is on the state to make sure that it's done efficiently and with relative ease? Well, I think, first of all, the state is responsible then to provide that state ID, okay? And I think oh, no matter young, old, no matter whatever that kind of situation it is, uh, to work with them. But you have 134 state reps, 67 senators. You have the governor's office, secretary of state's office. And in other states, the secretary of state's office is very engaged with AARP, Lutheran, Catholic, atheist, I mean, you name it, everybody, as far as getting the word out and doing voter education uh, to make sure that everybody knows, first of all, that they need to have one. Uh, we currently have a list that the Secretary of State Office has matched with the Department of Public Safety. So they have a list of people who are registered to vote but do not yet have an ID. The good news is we know their name, we know their address, we can mail them and work with them and contact them to make sure that they know. So there is so much that can be done to reach out to everybody and in the typical Minnesota way, using all of our connections and all of our groups uh, to be able to reach out to them. Two justices, as I mentioned earlier in this interview, um, the Supreme Court ruled on the language. Now, two justices dissented from that decision, and Justice Alan Page wrote in his dissent, I would conclude that the ballot question on the voting amendment proposed by the legislature is materially and fundamentally deceptive and misleading. Now, it's fair to say that you're going to disagree with this assessment. Yes, I but do it, disagree. So it, it does beg the question, though, why not put the language from the legislation directly on the ballot? Well, you know, the thing is you have precedent in the uh, legislative processes. And so in all its years since Minnesota has done constitutional amendments and in all the recent history, the process has been that you put a title on, you do the ballot question, and you don't put the complete actual amendment changes on the actual ballot itself. That's not done. And so as a legislator, uh, I would maybe agree that it would be good. I think it's just as Paul Anderson said, put it all on. I would agree. But that is not what the precedent was or the custom was. And so I followed that. And so the last two constitutional amendments uh, back in the early 2000s uh, were done in the same way. And that's why. Okay. And also, as we we're talking a little bit about some criticisms, critics also argue that if passed, this would disenfranchise certain segments of the population. Again, safe to say that you would um, disagree. I would disagree with that. With that. As a matter of fact, it will actually enfranchise them. It will actually make them more included. How so? Well, because when you're reaching out to give somebody a free state ID, that means you're giving them a free state ID, not only for voting purposes, but to open up a bank account, to, to do other things that are so common and so necessary that you have that ID. It, when they don't have that, it makes them vulnerable and dependent. And Andrew Young, former African-American mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, and then later an ambassador under, I believe, President Bill Clinton, supports photo ID. Uh, in part for that reason. It enables them to stand alone in the voting process, to have the dignity that goes with that, plus it's a valuable tool to be used in other facets of our society. And so I think it's an inclusive and franchising tool. And the big thing is to work with them and get out the word. Many of them, though, are on welfare benefits. So we can use that channel to communicate with them. Did you know you're going to be able to get a free state ID and help them to do that? This is so can do and is, an, is 
an inclusive and an enfranchising process rather than a disenfranchising. And in other states that have implemented photo ID, not one single case of disenfranchisement, not one in any of those states. So ultimately, what's the intention of of this piece of legislation, of this amendment? Increasing public confidence, which thereby will increase voter participation. Because if you don't have confidence, you don't participate. And so that focus is really, really important. And I think that's why the public supports photo ID so much, because they stand in line to vote. They have those questions and concerns. They go through everything else in life where they're required to show an ID. The most valuable public thing you can have is a ballot. Spends uh, people are elected from it who spend trillions of dollars. And so in the public realm, who you vote for is a secret. Who you are and where you live is not. It's a public list. It's a voter registration list. And so I think for all of us in realizing that the reason why there's a great public support for that is they have those questions. It'll increase public confidence. And the other thing is right now, Minnesota's system is a catch them and prosecute. Meantime, the ballot is cast and counted. But, oh, we spend a lot of money and a lot of time afterwards catching and prosecuting. Right now, Minnesota's number one, 174 convictions, another 66 waiting, and that's just from the 2008 election. It's taking four years, court time, prosecuting time. Meantime, their ballot can't be pulled out. It's still in there. There are 6,224 people who cast a ballot, still not able to be found don't know where they are. They've checked the list. They've checked all kinds of places for them. They're still there hanging in the wind. In the meantime, those ballots are counted and included in the vote total from that election. So I think those people who stand in line have those concerns and questions. That's why they support the requirement of photo ID. Getting off this particular amendment, just for one second, Secretary of State Mark Ritchie has proposed the ele electronic poll books. Is that something you would support if this measure fails? You know, it's interesting. I had electronic poll books in my um, statutory photo ID bill as well. And Secretary Ritchie then gave a price tag of about $50 million. When he came forward with his proposal for electronic poll books, um, he said it could be, it would be nearly free and done almost immediately. Somewhere in there, I think, is an interesting thing that both of us have talked about electronic poll books. The local units of government, counties, have said uh, that electronic poll books are a tool whose time is coming. Uh, we need to do this because the hand labor that we use right now, the old 19th century fill out pieces of paper, hand data entry into computers, and all the errors that go with that, that's expensive and getting more expensive. So the cost effectiveness of using an electronic poll book. But the difference is that mine works with a photo ID. And his is not with a photo ID. His is that an election judge, and I did this for 11 years, um, would have a stranger come in and without a photo ID in their hand, I'm supposed to recognize them from this picture in the poll book. That is a very unreliable type of ID. I think the fact that I look like that picture in the roster, maybe, if you want to have a picture there, fine. But the fact that I have my ID and that that picture matches that picture that's on the roster and I have it in my possession, now that is a strong basis for reliable ID that is used in many, many other places in society. So that's where they are different. Uh, but if the state mandates the use of them, then the state should pay and for the training and the cost to go with it. It may be that for the state of Minnesota, maybe it is a time that we would do something like this and get away from the antiquated paper entry. And the Pew Research Foundation did an intensive study nationally on the accuracy of the voter registration list, and it's shockingly bad just shockingly bad. But a lot of that is because we've been using this. So point of contact with the voter, data entry by swiping your driver's license, state ID card, or something like that, that we can make use of and have correct data entry at the point when the voter's there, that's something for the future. And Secretary Ritchie and I can agree on that. Representative Mary Kipmeyer, thanks for coming in and advocating for the voter photo ID. We certainly appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.